Good morning. Thank you for joining Dysautonomia International for our November 2018 webinar. We are joined by Dr. Jeff Boris, who's a member of our medical advisory board and a clinical professor of pediatrics at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, where he sees a whole bunch of patients with POTS. Um, and I'm not going to uh, have a long introduction here because I know we all want to get to the substance. So, Dr. Boris, take it away. Thank you, Lauren. Hi, everybody. Hope everyone's doing all right today. Um, and uh, what I wanted to do was uh, talk about a couple of research papers that our group put out uh, within the last few months uh, that reviews um, medication efficacy um, in the therapy of the symptoms for POTS in pediatric patients. So, um, as Lauren said, I am on the Medical Advisory Board for Dysautonomy International. Um, DI provided some financial support for one of the students working on our database, and I will be talking about both brand names and as well as off-label uses, um, which me, off-label means those are not FDA-approved uses for these medications. So, as I mentioned, we have two new published articles that came out. The first one is Utilization of Medications to Reduce Symptoms in Children with Postural Orthostatic Tachycardia Syndrome. The other one is Therapy for Fatigue and Cognitive Dysfunction in Postural Orthostatic Tachycardia Syndrome. Both of these were published um, just a couple months ago in Cardiology in the Young in August, of September, August and September of 2018. And yes, I know utilization is spelled differently. Cardiology in the Young is a British journal. <laughs> So what we did was we did a review of our uh, database that was um, through June of 2016. Uh, some of you have seen this slide before. There's 722 total patients seen with uh, the diagnosis of POTS um, at, uh, through that time. 708 of them were age 18 and under at that time is the largest known clinical pediatric POTS database in the United States. This is a retrospective review, meaning we're going backwards and looking seeing what happened. And the data was obtained through uh, clinical visit information um, from our electronic health record. And then we threw in the medications and looked to see how we did that. So we extracted all the medications ordered for our patients in the database who were age 18 and under. There were over 86,000 medication orders, including the refills. However, that included medications for allergies, antibiotics, asthma, that kind of thing. So we filtered it down, and uh, we further subdivided them by the symptoms, and we'll go over those results in a little bit. So we looked at um, therapies for dizziness or lightheadedness, headache, nausea, what we, what we term dysmotility or constipation, so um, early satiety, meaning um, uh, really hungry, take a couple bites, and then full, um, and then constipation, pain. Um, and, so, and that pain could be um, neuropathic pain, musculoskeletal pain, joint pain, uh, insomnia, difficulty getting or staying asleep, and then fatigue and cognitive dysfunction, sometimes referred to as brain fog. The way we looked at it, the patients had to have, when we looked, when we looked at the list of uh, the meds for these patients, the patient had to be on the same medication at the same dose, ordered consecutively at least five times. Um, and that, and so anybody who was on the medication only three times and then had a change, that was felt to be not um, efficacious or not um, therapeutically helpful for the patient. It's kind of a high standard to use, but um, I think it, I think it uh, was, uh, I, I wanted to have a very high standard for this, uh, for this article, for these articles. And then what we did was we uh, confirmed that these were, in fact, useful for these medications by doing a chart review. And just so you know, um, all of our patients were also treated with the typical non-pharmacologic stuff, um, increased fluid and salt intake, of course. Um, the modification that we've done of the Dallas POTS exercise protocol, the exercise protocol is sometimes referred to as the Levine protocol um, from University of Texas Southwestern. And for those that are not familiar with it, um, a version of the uh, CHOP modification of the uh, Dallas protocol is on the Dysautonomia International website. Uh, if the patient had heat intolerance, they uh, used uh, cooling vests. Um, there were some patients who were treated who had uh, dizziness or lightheadedness who were treated with uh, compression stockings. 
um, 20 to 30 millimeters of mercury, worn waist to toe, and worn while awake with, uh, with variable results. And then patients with insomnia were initially treated with instructions for good sleep hygiene. In other words, um, making sure the lights were down an hour before bed, uh, making sure the room was cool, getting rid of all the electronics, et cetera. And then, um, and then prior to using any other medications, we recommended um, first the use of uh, melatonin an hour before bed uh, up to a dose of nine milligrams. And if that failed, then we would go ahead and uh, move on to uh, utilizing um, medications for insomnia. So what do we find? Well, let's break it down. So for the lightheaded patients, we had 621 patients who were treated for that, um, split 490 female and 131 male. The median therapies, that means um, the most frequently uh, uh, seen number of therapies in, in, the, in the median, it's almost the mean, but not exactly, is two. So it took two times, to two medications, um, uh, to get efficacy or to get uh, a good therapeutic result. And that was equivalent in both females and in males. The medications included Florinaf or Fludrocortisone, Midodrine, and Desmopressin, also known as DDAVP. And you can see um, the total number of patients who had effective therapy, um, ranging from about 34% with midodrine to about 43% with Florinef. However, when we combined those, um, we had overall efficacy a little over 50%, about 52% of patients had improvement, clinical improvement as reported in the clinic um, for their lightheadedness. And that was really not statistically significantly different between females and males. The side effects that were seen um, included for fluidocortisone, rash, ankle swelling, headache, and mood changes. Uh, and mood changes include irritability, anxiety, or depression. Um, for the midodrine, we saw scalp tingling and goosebumps, headache, and supine hypertension, meaning normal blood pressure sitting up or standing up, but elevated blood pressure while lying down. And desmopressin caused um, headaches and also hyponatremia or low serum sodium, low sodium levels in the bloodstream. For headaches, uh, we had treated 425 patients. And again, the median therapies were two for both female and male. The therapies that we used um, included ciproheptadine, also known as periactin. It's an antihistamine. It's a very old school drug. It's been around for a long time. Verapamil, which is a calcium channel blocker. Metoprolol, atenolol, and nabivolol are all what are called beta blockers. They block the beta adrenergic receptors in the, uh, in the body. And um, therapeutic um, efficacy was kind of all over the place here, with uh, verapamil being um, the least um, likely to be helpful, although we did see patients who, who did have improvement with it, and I'll discuss that in just a second. <clears throat> Um, metoprolol uh, as a beta blocker was uh, the best. Overall, all, our ther uh, all, all therapeutic efficacy for headaches was about 48%, and that was, again, statistically not significant between females and males. There was an interesting article that came out uh, a couple of years ago that looked at, in the New England Journal of Medicine that compared the use of uh, topiramate or topamax um, amitriptyline, which is a tricyclic antidepressant, and placebo. And they got, uh, actually placebo did better than the other two medications, but um, they also found that the overall therapeutic efficacy was about between 45 and 50 percent, so we're getting about the same thing here. The older, liter the very older literature suggested that verapamil initially was going to be a good therapy for um, headaches, especially migraines. As time has gone on, um, it has been shown to not be as effective in the neurology literature. But again, as I mentioned here, we, we did have some patients who had some, uh, some improvement with it. So uh, I don't throw it out um, uh, totally. From a side effect standpoint, um, ciproheptadine caused increased appetite and weight gain, uh, as well as fatigue. The rapamil, metoprolol, atenolol, and nabivolol all are used in the cardiology group, um, in the cardiology community for blood pressure lowering. And so we can see lightheadedness and low blood pressure 
um, for the beta blockers, um, we also can see some exercise intolerance, and rarely it can do it can unmask depression. Um, that's not common. Uh, one of the things that we did do, though, with uh, nabivolol, nabivolol doesn't get into the brain as easily as the other beta blockers. And so if we saw that the beta blockers were causing fatigue, we would switch to nabivolol and we would see, <clears throat> excuse me, we would see a little bit less uh, fatigue with that. In the treatment of nausea, we had 302 patients. And um, we, uh, uh, the medication that we had most success with was, uh, was Zofran or Ondansetron. Um, we also used scopalamine. Some people know that as the seasickness patch that goes behind your ear. We also used um, meclizine, but uh, it's a very small number of patients who had, uh, who had uh, effective therapy with it. Overall, 39% um, percent of patients had uh, improvement with nausea. So nausea is a tough one to treat. In the median therapies there uh, above, you can see for males, it took only one medication to try to improve their symptoms, whereas for females, uh, it took two. So that was actually statistically significantly different. The side effects for uh, these medications for uh, ondansetron was fatigue and constipation, priscopalamine, uh, blurry vision, and what's called a contact dermatitis, which means that uh, there was a skin rash that was really itchy. And if that happened, it was very difficult to, uh, to suppress with um, uh, with medications. The only way we could get rid of it was stop using it. And then meclizine, uh, the big side effect was uh, fatigue. For dysmotility and for constipation, so early satiety as well, um, 226 patients were treated with this. And um, we used um, two medications overall for this. We used pyridostigmine, also known as mestinon and erythromycin, which is actually an antibiotic. A lot of people don't realize that in low doses, erythromycin is used as a promotility uh, agent, which can help to move, um, move things along. Overall, our success rate was 43%, um, uh, no different between male and female. Um, one thing I think that a lot of folks are not familiar with is that pyridostigmine um, is uh, is typically not used for promotility, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. It's, it's, it's a medication that's used in patients who have myasthenia gravis, which is an autoimmune disorder um, that, uh, that also affects, uh, that's also a neuromuscular um, uh, disease. From a side effect standpoint, pyridostigmine caused abdominal pain, diarrhea, and muscle twitching, and erythromycin can also cause some, uh, some stomach pain. And speaking of pain, um, we had 113 patients treated for pain. Um, the median therapies here were one for female and two for male, so males required um, more, um, uh, often required a second um, or a different medication choice. We used uh, duloxetine, which is also known as Cymbalta. It's marketed as an antidepressant, but it's also used for chronic pain. The other medication we used was pregabalin, also known as Lyrica. Um, and uh, pregabalin uh, originally came out as an anti-seizure medication, but is also used for chronic pain. O our overall efficacy for these patients was 53%. Side effects for uh, for uh, Cymbalta or Duloxetine included fatigue and mood changes, and for uh, pregabalin, um, uh, mood changes. And again, the mood changes include uh, those things that you see below, irritability, anxiety, or depression. For insomnia, we had 138 patients whom we treated, um, and uh, both requiring a median number of therapies of two. And again, to remind you, um, these patients were treated only after they failed the use of sleep, uh, appropriate sleep hygiene as well as melatonin. We used four therapies for this, clonidine. Uh, clonidine is a medication that's also used as an antihypertensive uh, medication. Trazodone is an antidepressant. Um, Zolpidem and, and uh, esopiclone um, are uh, Ambien and Lunesta. Uh, respectively, and those are specifically marketed as um, medications for insomnia. Overall efficacy was about 43%, as you can see there. Um, low numbers, 59 uh, out of 138, but, um, but patients did uh, have some improvement with that. 
um, as you can imagine, um, fatigue um, and uh, was a sort of a persistent side effect from these, especially the clonidine. Trazodone can also cause uh, sleep paralysis. So the patients would be awake, but they um, uh, but they felt like they couldn't move. It was sort of a str it's not it wasn't common, but we saw this in a few patients. And then both zolpidem and esopiclone can cause what's called parasomnia. So that would be sleep talking, sleep walking, sleep eating. Mercifully, we did not have any sleep driving, uh, but uh, but those those have been seen uh, and described in the medical literature. And finally, for fatigue and cognitive dysfunction, uh, 517 patients, so a lot there. Um, again, the median number of therapies were two each, and we used a whole different armamentarium of, uh, uh, or a whole armamentarium of different medications. Methylphenidate is also known as Ritalin. Mixed amphetamine salts is Adderall. Dexmethylphenidate is also known as Focalin. Lys dexamphetamine is uh, Vyvanse. Atomoxetine is Stratera. Modafinil and Armodafinil are uh, Provigil and Nuvigil, respectively. The first four are stimulants. Um, uh, atomoxetine or Stratera is actually a selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. It's related to um, some of the antidepressants. And we don't know the actual mechanism of function of modafinil and armodafinil, but, uh, but it's used specifically for uh, patients who have sleep disorders. Um, overall, you can see that we had uh, a 69% success rate in treating our fatigue and cognitive dysfunction. Pretty good quite good, really. Um, from a side effect standpoint, um, a lot of patients had, a lot of these caused the same issues, decreased appetite, weight loss, insomnia, headache, and mood changes. Uh, the other stimulants had the same, as did modafinil and armodafinil, and then mood changes were also seen in, uh, in atomoxetine. So that's the review of our medications um, and uh, for the various uh, uh, for the various symptoms of POTS. So some things to keep in mind, of course, this is a study in pediatric patients, right? So adult patients may not respond the same way. Um, not everyone practices the way that I do. And I think that there, there's a lot of variability in uh, POTS providers across the country and around the world. Um, some providers are much less aggressive with medication therapy. Um, some don't always use what I refer to as a rational approach to therapy. In other words, they don't individualize the therapy to the patient or they don't necessarily optimize the therapy based on side effects as well as primary effects. Um, what they'll do is they might use the same group of medications um, because that's what they do. Um, and having said that, you know, what I'm doing might not be the right way to do it either. You know, um, it's just, it's, it's, it's the approach that I have taken. Dr. Barris, can I just ask a quick question on behalf of someone that uh, had a medication question? What is the difference between Zofran and Reglan? So Reglan um, is the trade name for metoclopramide. Um, metoclopramide is a uh, dopamine, <laughs> okay, uh, I think it's, it, it, it works on the dopamine system, whereas Zofran or Ondansetron works on the serotonin system. So those are so so their mechanism of action uh, is different. Zofran works on is typically utilized for nausea. Reglan is used for motility. I don't use Reglan. Um, I, I will say when I was in training for in my general pediatrics a long time ago, <laughs> um, when we had babies who had reflux, we would use something like Zantac and Reglan all the time and didn't think anything of it. In the last 10 to 15 years, however, we, we, the medical literature has uh, demonstrated that chronic use, meaning more than three of uh, Reglan uh, use, ha has been associated with movement disorders that can be either transient or even permanent. Now, having said that, there are some patients who, maybe even some in the audience, who when they have a migraine, are given Reglan as an abortive therapy, in other words, a therapy to uh, stop uh, a headache. That's okay because you're not using it chronically, you're just using it intermittently. 
Yeah, I think that answered it. Um, I just wanted to just let everyone know you can type questions in. Um, there should be on your go to webinar control panel um, a little spot that says questions that you can type things in. So we'll try to get to the questions at the end. I just thought that was a good one for like right now since you're talking about all the meds. Totally. So, um, you know, not everyone was put on medications. There were some patients who didn't want to use them, and I think that's fine. I think that's, I think that's a fair approach. Um, some wanted to try the non-pharmacologic interventions alone, so that included the stuff that we talked about before, the fluid, the salt, the exercise, cooling vests, um, compression stockings, that kind of thing. There are some patients that we saw that had specific symptoms spontaneously improved when other symptoms were treated. So, for example, um, occasionally when we would treat dizziness or lightheadedness, we would see improvement in fatigue and cognitive dysfunction. So, you know, not all the time, not frequently, but occasionally saw that. Um, as well, sometimes treating the insomnia would help the fatigue, but not always. Um, but, we, but we did definitely uh, want to make sure that patients had adequate sleep. Uh, when considering the issues of, uh, of uh, fatigue in these patients. Um, there were multiple uses for some of these medications. So, for example, um, ciproheptadine or periactin can also be used for appetite stimulation. As you saw from the side effects, it can increase your appetite. And there are, some, there are a lot of POTS patients who have really low appetite, and so this can be beneficial for them from that standpoint. Scopalamine, the sea sickness patch, um, we use that also for patients who had excessive sweating, but we made sure that um, the, uh, when, we were, when we did the chart review that these patients were actually being treated for the things that we um, uh, were reporting on. In other words, ciproheptadine was used for headaches and scopalamine was used um, for nausea. Um, interestingly, modafinil and armodafinil did not work for cognitive dysfunction. So for those folks that might be familiar with the attention deficit hyperactivity d uh, disorder literature, um, provigil and nuvigil are increasingly being used as an, as, an, as an alternative therapy for these patients, and it really makes a difference. Um, we, did, we saw in our group of patients that it helped with the fatigue but didn't do anything for the cognitive dysfunction. The one thing that we did find, though, is that if we had to use them in combination with one of the stimulants, it would potentiate or sort of um, increase the efficacy of the stimulant. So we could use a much lower dose of the uh, stimulant in conjunction with the provigil, and that would help for the, um, uh, for the cognitive dysfunction. As I mentioned before, um, there, uh, and, and I wanted to kind of get into this a little bit, um, pyridostigmine or mestinon has not been uh, routinely used as a promotility agent. I'm glad someone brought up uh, the, what Reglan is. There's an old study that compared metoclopramide or Reglan with, with pyridostigmine specifically for promotility, and not surprisingly, metoclopramide uh, did better than pyridostigmine. There's a recent study um, from Dr. DiLorenzo in Ohio that uh, it would say, uh, uh, I guess a case series that showed that uh, pyridostigmine um, is in fact helpful for GI motility. And, and honestly, that's how I found it. Um, uh, when, when I started taking care of POS patients here at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, um, I started using a lot more medications because my patients were a lot more severe. And the, the older POTS literature said that mestinon or pyridostigmine could be helpful in general for POTS. What I would see is it didn't necessarily help uh, the lightheadedness or the tachycardia or anything like that per se, but a lot of patients were coming in saying, my nausea is better, my constipation is better, um, my appetite is better. And so I sort of noticed that and said, okay, let's, uh, let's use it that way and go, go in that direction. As I mentioned before, um, if uh, the beta blockers like metoclopramide or atenolol were successful for headaches, but there was too much fatigue, we would switch them to nabivolol because nabivolol doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier, doesn't get into the uh, brain as easily. 
And then, of course, um, I was not doing this in a vacuum. Um, for patients who failed several therapies, uh, they would be referred for further treatment. So we have a GI motility clinic here. We have a neurology headache program, et cetera. So we, we have multiple um, specialty programs here at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia that, uh, were, that uh, we also utilized um, to help uh, uh, further evaluate and manage the symptoms that I was not able to take care of for these kids. Um, something else to keep in mind, not everyone stayed with our program. Um, some people fired us, and from my standpoint, that's okay. My goal is that the patient gets better. Uh, as, long as, as long as it's not illegal and no one gets hurt, we're all good. And then um, there were some patients who were tried on one medication once with no other entries ever. And those patients were not included in the analysis. Um, as I mentioned before, I, I tried to keep a high uh, threshold for uh, for the uh, for this for these studies, which is why I used um, five or more consecutive uh, uh, orders of the same medication at the same dose. So it's possible that in our in our review, some patients just didn't have long enough follow up. So, for example, some patients uh, had the same medication or dose ordered four times, but then didn't have any further follow up. So they, that could have increased our numbers, but we did not include those. So it is possible that there might be improvement in some of these numbers. I think these are just sort of threshold numbers from my standpoint. And I think the other thing to keep in mind, and, and, and Lauren has heard me use this term before, this is only what I refer to as POTS 1.0. In other words, we don't know what causes POTS. Um, so what we're doing is we're treating the symptoms and trying to help patients be more functional, get back to school, get back to sports, get off to college, um, you know, do their activities of daily living, that kind of thing. So we're not treating the underlying pathophysiology since we don't know exactly what it is. And when we do, then we'll treat it as, if you will, POTS 2.0. And that might be iterative too. That you know, that might be down the line. We might even get to a POTS 3.0 once we really understand how best to uh, evaluate and manage this. And of course, um, this was not a double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled prospective study. Um, patients were their own internal controls, but. Um, these types of retrospective studies can be completely discounted by a good prospective controlled study, which is the ideal type of scientific study, which we really need. So into the future, um, we uh, have some funding in our CHOP POTS Research Fund. Um, we're going to bring the uh, POTS database up through February of 2018, we had frozen it in June of 2016 at 722 patients. Um, I, ha I actually have a uh, medical student working with me um, as we speak who is updating the information in the database, and that's going to be almost 950 patients, so a much an, an even larger um, uh, group of folks that we, can, uh, that we can look at outcomes and that kind of deal. And we'll look at our demographics and medication outcomes with the larger numbers. We're also planning on performing uh, more complex data analyses, looking for uh, looking for patterns that we might not be able to see um, uh, on the outside, um, but sort of mixing and matching with computers the uh, the data and doing what's called heuristics. And then what we also want to do is create a questionnaire and go back to our patients and uh, assess their quality of life and their overall POTS clinical outcomes and, and other outcomes as well. So that's what we're looking at uh, hopefully down the road. So in summary, uh, medications to treat the various symptoms of POTS can be beneficial. Um, we use them, of course, in conjunction with other non-pharmacologic therapies. Uh, we use them to suppress symptoms so that patients can exercise to more fully improve their POTS. Um, the success, as you saw, varied by symptom and by medication, anywhere from 39 to 69%. Some medications showed as low as a 9% efficacy individually. But for those patients whom they helped, other therapies didn't. So it shouldn't necessarily be thrown out out of hand or, or uh, ruled out out of hand. And as I always tell my patients, and I'm sure you have both heard and found as well, what works for one patient doesn't work for others. This is probably, this is uh, the largest known retrospective series of medication outcomes in pediatric POTS patients. 
Um, we do need studies that are randomized and prospective so we can assess the true efficacy of these medications. And, uh, and that's it. Um, Lauren asked me to uh, make a brief comment about, the, uh, about um, uh, what's happening at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia with the management of patients with POTS. Um, we have a new um, program called the Acquired Autonomic Dysfunction Program. Um, it is a multidisciplinary program that uh, includes um, uh, cardiology, including myself, um, neurology, uh, gastroenterology, um, so or social work, psychology, and psychiatry separately, physical therapy, pharmacy, general pediatrics, I'm probably missing some others. Um, and what we are trying to do is improve the way we manage uh, the patients with POTS and uh, assess uh, the various aspects of, uh, of them um, uh, and the various symptomatologies. So it's still a POTS 1.0 approach, but um, it's getting um, uh, people a lot smarter than me uh, involved to, uh, to help group uh, and co-manage these uh, these patients. So um, we've started off with a uh, with a small number of days of clinic at the present time, but we hope to improve it after we iron out the kinks. We've only had three um, three clinic days so far, so um, uh, we hope to uh, increase this over time. So that's that. Okay, I have questions that people have posted and I, I don't think I just want everyone to know there's a ton of questions and I'm sorry if we don't get to all of them um, but Dr. Barris we have you until noon right oh, yeah. Yeah, let's go. okay and you talk fast so we'll get through a lot of these <laughs> so here's a question that probably came in early during the webinar um, when you were starting to talk about headache drugs um, Imitrex this this patient says what about things like Imitrex Frova and Topamax Okay, so um, Imitrex and Frova are in the class of medications called the triptan. So let, let's back up. There's two ways to treat. Uh, there's two ways to treat headaches overall. There is um, abortive therapy, and there's prophylaxis or preventive therapy. Um, abortive therapy is you get a headache, you take a medication to stop it. It doesn't prevent other headaches from coming in the future, but at least it stops it at that time. That's what the triptans like Imitrex and Frova do. I don't use those. My colleagues in neurology do. Um, as far as Topamax, again, um, uh, Topamax, well, Topamax is a prophylactic therapy, and uh, or Topiramate is the generic name for it. And um, uh, my colleagues in neurology use that. So I had patients who, uh, if they failed my therapeutic approaches, would be seen by neurology and would be put on uh, topiramate or uh, amitriptyline. Or they, there are actually a number of other um, uh, therapeutic approaches that they used. Um, they used um, you know, some folks have heard of acephaly, which is a uh, which is kind of a um, uh, a thing that goes on your head that can help to reduce um, headaches. So there's 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 lots of approaches that uh, that the neurology folks use, but uh, this is what our clinic was specifically using. Well, while you mentioned cephaly, I also wanted to mention uh, the gamma core device, which um, I'm starting to see some patients talk about it on the support groups on Facebook, and it's it's an FDA approved device in the US and it's got the European approval in most of uh, the EU for migraine and cluster headache and so this is kind of an interesting um, device it's external it's just something you hold up to your neck for a few minutes a day and you stimulate your vagus nerve and so we haven't seen any POTS research specifically on this device but there is actually there are two uh, vagus nerve stimulation uh, research studies occurring in POTS right now, one at Vanderbilt and one at University of Oklahoma. So I think it's kind of neat that this tool is already FDA approved for migraine, and we know that a, over 40% of POTS patients have migraines. So it's something you might want to talk to your doctors about if you have a lot of migraines and you're looking for something that maybe isn't a drug. Um, it seems just anecdotally, like patients are saying this is pretty helpful when they gain access to it. A lot of insurance still doesn't cover it, 
even though it's FDA approved. So it's it might be a bit of a battle to get your insurance to cover it. But I just thought I'd mention it. And I think, uh, I think you know, t the the concept of talking to your physician about um, about some of these therapies is is fine. Um, I, I, I you know I, I think there are some physicians and some providers, you know, non physicians like nurse practitioners and PAs and whatnot who are also caring for POTS patients um, who will use sort of non-traditional off-label uses and that kind of thing. Um, as with everything else that we do in the field of medicine, you know, we always want to be able to use, as, as best as possible, have a, um, um, have a scientific approach if we can um, and have a research-based approach. And so, um, uh, your, your, your doctors may tell you that, uh, or your provider might tell you that uh, he or she may want to wait until the results of the vagus nerve stimulator trials come out um, before in, in, in the use of POTS patients before uh, ordering them. Right, but they're already out for migraine. So I think that if your doctor gave you a hard time and you already have a migraine diagnosis, I would I would definitely mention that it's it's that's been published already and it's FDA approved. So I don't I don't think anyone should be jumping to do it just for POTS if they don't have um, a, a confirmed migraine or, or cluster headache diagnosis yet. So anyways, here's the next question. Um, it's just a question that says propranolol. I'm pretty sure you covered that in your talk, but I'm not sure. Yeah. I didn't. Um, oh, you didn't. So okay. I didn't. I don't use propranolol. Um, for a couple of reasons. Um, so propranolol is also a beta blocker. Um, the neurology literature likes it very much for migraine prophylaxis. Um, there are also some uh, POTS providers who like it very much. And, and there was a study that, it was a study from Vanderbilt several years back in adults where they compared uh, a single dose of low dose propranolol versus higher dose propranolol. In, in their patients, and they found that low-dose propranolol reduced symptoms um, and was well-tolerated. So I put a lot of my patients on propranolol, and they all passed out. Now, having said that, <laughs> um, I, I do know that, uh, that uh, Dr. Satish Raj, who had been at Vanderbilt and is in Calgary, um, still uses um, low-dose propranolol in adults and gets very good results. I think, um, and, and I think there are other folks who use propranolol as well. Um, it, it's often used anywhere from two to four times a day in in a very in a very low dose, and that you know one of the things about propranolol, um, it's it's what's called a non-selective beta blocker. So there are multiple beta receptors in the body, um, and uh, propranolol sort of blocks all of them. It's, that's why it's called non-selective. So um, it. Uh, it, it tends, it, it can tend to have more side effects in some patients, um, but uh, but others see efficacy. Again, um, I I tried it for a few patients and and it caused worsening lightheadedness and worsening um, syncope, worsening passing out, and so I stopped using it. But that, that, doesn't, was, mean it, that doesn't it doesn't mean it doesn't work. Yeah, I think that so much of POTS is really individualized and. Um, I tried low dose propanolol and had worsening fatigue and lightheadedness and and I think it made my mast cell stuff worse too though I'm not sure on that um but so but there are other patients who do great on it so right. there you go that's that's a non answer i guess um, well, i mean it, it 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 just it just shows us how how little we know about pots right i think yeah. um to your point about mast cell activation um uh, that's a good point and 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 specifically, beta blockers can worsen symptoms of uh, mast cell activation syndrome. So probably not indicated in those folks. Yeah. Um, so here's a question that you're going to answer, and then I'm going to add to your answer because I've got plenty to say on this topic. <laughs> the question is: Are you using high dose IVIG to treat any pediatric patients with POTS who have positive autoimmune antibodies? So, the short answer is no, um, and the long answer is that um, uh, just because they have autoimmune antibodies does not mean that, that it's, it's the cause of their POTS. 
and I think um, I'm, I'm one of those folks, especially since IVIG is very expensive. Um, and also IVIG, at least here at Children's Hospital Philadelphia, is locked down. In other words, unless you have a specific diagnosis for which it is approved, something like Kawasaki's disease or an immune deficiency or that kind of thing, um, I cannot just write for it. Um, so I am uh, awaiting um, the results of, um, uh, to, to, uh, of the literature to show that, in fact, um, these autoantibodies um, that, that have been found are the cause of postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, and then want to see that a therapy like IVIG, which is not without side effects also, um, and is a blood product, um, is, uh, is uh, safe and effective um, to use. Uh, I know Lauren's going to talk about uh, the, the latest research on this, so I'm going to hand it over to you. Yeah. So um, this is obviously an area of interest to all of us. Um, you know, what's going on with the autoimmune research in POTS, and is it everyone? Is it some of us? Do we even know what it is yet? And I think that, you know, here's here's sort of the, the brief summary of it. We've found uh, a lot of different autoantibodies in POTS patients that we are not exactly sure if they're the cause of POTS or the consequence of POTS or maybe just an antibody that's present in POTS when there's some other immunological thing going on. Um, the interesting stuff is, you know, it's been mostly small cohort studies to date, meaning like, you know, 20 patients, 30 patients, something like that. And we're starting, we have started studies on larger cohorts of patients where we collect from 100 patients at once, 120 patients at once, to see do what we found in the small studies, do they scale up? Do we see that in larger, more diverse POTS populations? Um, and there's ongoing research to figure out which of these antibodies, if any, are pathogenic, meaning they cause the lightheadedness, they cause the GI symptoms. And, and I think there's a good possibility that they do, but we don't have, it's not written in stone yet, right? It's, it's ongoing research. Um, and all of us, including all the doctors, want this research to happen as quickly as possible and as accurately as possible. We don't wanna rush stuff and come out with junk science. We want um, really solid data that doctors can rely on to make good clinical decisions. So are there some pediatric patients or adult patients who are using IVIG for positive antibodies? Yes, but it, it depends on what they have. Some POTS patients have, like me, overlapping known autoimmune diseases that are, that are pretty clearly defined. They have overlapping Sjogren's or overlapping um, scleroderma or lupus or something like that, where it's acceptable to give a Sjogren's patient with a lot of neuropathy IVIG completely separate from their POTS diagnosis. And we do tend to see that their POTS symptoms get better um, or, or improve pretty, pretty significantly. But that's not enough to say, well, everyone with POTS needs this IVIG stuff. So what we're doing right now is um, Dysautonomy International funded the first IVIG clinical trial at UT Southwestern with, um, it's led by Dr. Steve Ronino, who's a very, very respected uh, autoimmune dysautonomia researcher. And um, Dr. Goodman at Mayo Clinic is collaborating, and I'm actually collaborating, wearing my sort of, um, uh, I guess I'm, I guess I'm a scientist, but not in a traditional sense. <laughs> um, so the so we're doing the first 10 patients in a, a pilot study. This is sort of how expensive research works. You do 10 patients, you see if you get any positive results. And then if you do, then you upscale it and you add another 40 patients. So you have a total of 50, and then you upscale it bigger than that. But just this first 10 patient study, that is gonna cost Dysautonomy International $100,000. And that doesn't cover the drug. Thankfully, uh, the drug company Griffles actually donated $2.2 .2 million worth of IVIG just for those 10 patients to have a six month trial. So just think about how much a study would cost if it was on 100 patients. 
it would be astronomical. So we need to sort of go slow and, and um, do 10 patients and then see what happens and then add more. Um, so I know, I know that's not really the answer anyone wants. We want, you know, we want the answer now, should we do this or not? But I think the, there's no reason anyone with POTS who doesn't have a defined autoimmune disease should be, should be pursuing IVIG right now. Um, if you have, if you have antibodies that confirm a, a known autoimmune disease that responds to IVIG or other immunotherapy, then I think it's pretty reasonable to pursue that, but um, not just for sort of POTS with a little bit of ANA, which is, is pretty common amongst us. So I hope, Dr. Brush, is that past the doctor approval answer? <laughs> I, think, I think if you look at the list of medications that I just went through for our two studies, um, the large majority of them are already used for those symptoms. In other words, they're used for nausea, they're used for headaches, they're used for sleep. Um, they're used for at least cognitive dysfunction from an ADHD standpoint. You know, they're used for uh, for dizziness. So it's not as if we're taking IVIG, which is totally not used for for something like postural orthostatic tachycardia, and using it um, uh, all of you know all of a sudden. Um, one of the things that we in the in the, the medical field and in the scientific field want to avoid is something called the loss of equipoise, which means that if a therapy gets adopted and um, is starts being used widely and is felt to or believed to be therapeutic and helpful and beneficial and all that other stuff, but we don't have any research to prove it, We've lost equipoise. We really don't know what's actually going on. And so to do these research studies to prove that they actually work and to demonstrate that these are efficacious, you know, that's, that's really important. I mean, um, you know, IVIG is, it can, can be as much as $10,000 a, a, a single dose and, or more. Yeah, and, more. I, mine is more. <laughs> and oh, but you're getting, well, never mind. Um, we'll, we'll deal with that later. Um, and, um, uh, and, and, and what I'm hearing Lauren say is that in these trials, it's not a single dose, right? So these patients right. are getting multiple doses over time. So that, 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 um, cranks out the cash register pretty quickly. Yeah. The, probably the biggest challenge, uh, is, is getting insurance approval for it. Even even someone who's like a millionaire would actually have a hard time paying for IVIG long term. It's ten to twenty thousand dollars a dose for every month. You have to stay on it. It's not something you take once and then you never have to take it again, uh, except in a handful of of uh, conditions where it's sort of short term dosing. Um, and right now, there's no insurance company that's going to give you IVIG coverage for POTS. If you can hang your hat on another diagnosis that they do cover it for, um, even even on like the list of approved diseases that they cover it for, they you know they cover IVIG for CIDP. You still have to meet very stringent criteria for within CIDP to get the IVIG covered by insurance. And even then, they routinely deny it, hoping that you just won't appeal which creates a huge administrative nightmare for your doctors. Imagine if you're a POTS doctor and suddenly, you know, you have 200 patients that need an appeal um, that there's really no evidence to win on because we don't have the solid research yet. So um, one thing that we do worry about sort of policy wise as an organization is that as more and more POTS patients are seeking IVIG, the insurance companies are not dumb. They're taking notice of this. And instead of arguing out in an appeals all the time with you, what they're going to start doing is just putting it in their insurance medical policies. We do not cover IVIG for POTS, period. And then when we do have that research, let's say five years from now, the research is done and it shows that IVIG helps for, you know, let's say 50% of POTS patients respond really well and, and could benefit from IVIG. Um, it's going to be an uphill battle to reverse those insurance policies that happened because patients were pursuing this before there was any credible research. 
So I know it's hard to say that to someone who's like desperately ill and wants to just get whatever they can to help them, but think about the bigger policy impact that your interaction with your insurance company has. Um, they they see enough people coming in asking for POTS with no research to back it up. They're just going to put it in their policy and say no one can get it. So um, that's just you know a little bit of policy commentary, I guess. Let's move on to the next subject. Um, Actually, just uh, one okay. comment. So <laughs> that's, that's actually why, in part, I wrote these two papers, was specifically for the insurance companies. Now, most of these medications are um, generic and off-label and not particularly um, expensive, but some of them are. And specifically, the biggest pushback that I would get would be for uh, therapy for fatigue and, and cognitive dysfunction, um, for uh, trying to get the stimulants and, and things like that, because those are not cheap medications uh, over time. And so having this data out there uh, is something that uh, that we all kind of need to, to be able to move the field forward, number one, but number two, um, give ammunition to the POTS providers to go to, back to the insurance companies and say, look, you know, this, this stuff really does work. Yeah. Um, how about some commentary from you on the use of antihistamines in POTS and, and managing um, mast cell activation syndrome? And maybe just for, for somebody who might be newly diagnosed and listening, you know, what, what is mast cell activation syndrome and how does it relate to POTS? So the mast cells are part of our immune system. They're sort of like the guards. They're the sentries. They're, they're the ones that sample our environment looking for all kinds of proteins, good or bad. And uh, the bad ones, of course, would be the ones that would activate our immune system and say, you, you know, there's an invader. We need to go ahead and, uh, and uh, call, in the, call in the troops and, and kill it off before it kills us. So in mast cell activation syndrome, unfortunately, the mast cells, for whatever reason, um, are highly reactive. And the mast cells release all kinds of chemical mediators tons and tons of different ones that, that cause all kinds of, um, uh, not only calling in the immune system, but cause all kinds of symptoms. And so these patients often have things like flushing. So they're sitting there and all of a sudden they feel like they have just the worst hot flash and they get real red and that kind of thing. They can have really bad itchiness or pruritus. They can have hives. Um, so, um, a number of them have uh, a, a large number of food intolerances. And so, um, Therapy for mast cell, act so actually, let's back up. The diagnosis of mast cell activation is based on um, the historical features as well as um, uh, getting certain laboratory studies to prove that the, uh, the mast cells are putting out these inflammatory uh, chemicals. And then, um, and then also um, uh, demonstrating that there is a therapeutic response. So the first, uh, the typical first approach to um, treating mast cell activation is uh, using antihistamines, as was mentioned. So there's two main classes of antihistamines, the H1 and the H2 blockers. Uh, most people have heard of both of them. The H1 blockers are things like um, uh, Claritin or Allegra or Zyrtec. Those are the H1 type of blockers. And the H2 blockers, most folks have heard of too, Zantac or Tagamet um, those, or Pepsid, those kind of things. And that's, by the way, the H2 blockers, as you, as you can probably guess, are medications that are used for acid reflux, but they're not the same kind of medications as the proton pump inhibitors, which would be um, like... Um, uh, shoot, um, well, Prilosec and uh, Nexium and those kind of things. Those those are those are PPIs. Those are not effective for uh, for mast cell activation. There's other medications that are used in mast cell activation as well, including um, Singular or Montelukast, which blocks leukotrienes. Um, also, the use of Gastrochrome. Chromalin sodium is a uh, an oral medication that is used for uh, stabilization of the mast cells. And um, there's some um, uh, IV um, or subcutaneous um, uh, monoclonal antibodies that are used as well. There's a, there's a lot of different stuff. Um, a number of allergist immunologists are not particularly familiar with mast cell activation. I think, I think mast, mast cell activation syndrome is uh, slowly, increasingly being recognized. 
um, there was uh, there was a um, uh, several months back there was a, a symposium at the National Institute of uh, Allergy and Infectious Diseases that was uh, that was looking at this and looking uh, sort of where the field needs to go. And actually, Lauren and I both uh, both attended that. Um, there's, you know, uh, ho hopefully more allergist immunologists will be uh, uh, will be educated and familiar with this, but it's going to take some time to to do it. If you can find a uh, uh, an allergy immunologist who is uh, allergist immunologist who is uh, familiar with it, um, that that person can be really beneficial in helping to suppress symptoms. So, how does it relate to POTS? Well. Um, a lot of, not a lot, I, I, would, I would sort of thumbnail about 15% of the patients with POTS, and, and this has actually been borne out by other sort of smaller studies too, about 10 to 15% of patients with POTS may have uh, mast cell activation syndrome. And so what happens is when you have the flushing, you can also get tachycardia, you can also get lightheadedness, um, you can also get hypotension. Um, and you can also have other symptoms of POTS that can be that can be made worse um, by um, uh, by that. Did we lose you? <laughs> Come here. Okay. Hospital beeping noises. <laughs> no. Um. I uh, I have a I have a patient in an hour, and I'm getting a call from my front desk. They can wait. <laughs> okay. Um. So. Uh, here's a quick question. Let's just do some quick, uh, quick questions and answers since we only have a few minutes left, and I want to get through as many as we can. Um, low dose ne naltrexone for POTS. Have you ever used this, or do you know any patients who've had results with it? Absolutely. So um, low dose naltrexone, uh, I have used um, specifically not for POTS, but for the pain associated with POTS. And um, I have uh, a number of patients, a small number of patients who have been on uh, LDN before. <laughs> Um, for those that don't know, naltrexone is the long-acting oral version of naloxone, also known as Narcan, which is the, the nasal spray or the shot that's used to reverse um, narcotic overdoses. However, in, uh, in low, very low doses, like 10 times lower than typical, um, low-dose naltrexone can reduce some aspect of uh, inflammation um, of what's called the glial cells, which are some cells that can release some, re release some inflammatory mediators around nerves and cause some, um, um, some neuropathic pain. So I'm hoping that when we get the, um, uh, the database brought up to date, that I can look at some of our LDN patients and see how they did too. Um, there is a mom saying her adolescent daughter was um prescribed Valium for the chronic, for pain associated with POTS, and they haven't been able to find a POTS specialist. And um, obviously I know you can't give specific medical advice to an individual patient without actually seeing them, but just as a concept, you know, is, is Valium a good idea for chronic pain? Um, so Valium is in the class of medications called the benzodiazepines. Um, also includes um, Xanax and Ativan and those kind of things. Um, I'm not a big fan. I'm, I'm, I would be concerned about the use of benzodiazepines for chronic pain, um, only because they are um, uh, they they can be addictive, and um, uh, so I'm I'm not a I, I'm I'm not familiar with it for the use of for chronic pain. But I, I think if you can find some an alternative to that, I would recommend it. Um, and then here's a uh, maybe maybe our final question. Um, so a patient with a pediatric patient with high blood pressure associated with their POTS, which I think it's important, especially for people who are kind of new to this, there's a, there's sort of a lot of assumption amongst the patient community that POTS patients always have low blood pressure. And I think it's important for people to know that a subset of POTS patients have low blood pressure, um, a subset have normal blood pressure on standing, and another subset actually develop high blood pressure when they stand up. So we're all a little different. That's probably part of why the medication use um, really differs amongst different patients. But so here's the question for Dr. Boris. So um, this, this person's used a lot of five different beta blockers and none of them have really worked to lower the blood pressure. 
Um, are there other things besides beta blockers that, that doctors use to try to lower blood pressure in POTS patients? Sure. So um, there, there are several um, options that can be used um, if, if beta blockade doesn't work. Um, one of them is actually clonidine, which I mentioned before, um, and there are some folks that use clonidine for that. Um, um, potentially, verapamil could be used, although I would be concerned that if, if uh, verapamil was used, or, or any of the calcium channel blockers, um, that it could get a, uh, a compensatory tachycardia, meaning you, dr you drop the blood pressure enough and the heart rate goes up to try to make up for that loss of blood pressure. But if you bring it down to normal, uh, you know, the, the heart rate might actually uh, not, not crank up quite so much. Um, there, th those are sort of the two um, big ones that, that I would consider. Obviously, th um, a, a, something else that, um, uh, that has come out in some of the research, I believe Dr. Kem from Oklahoma has, has talked about the use of, um, of uh, a, 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 or the acknowledgement that there are autoantibodies against the angiotensin um, receptors, and the angi angiotensin helps to um, uh, modulate blood pressure. And so using a medication in the angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor group, um, may all, like um, uh, lisinopril or enalapril, may potentially be helpful as well. Just have to see how it goes. Actually, you know what, Dr. Stewart, um, Julian Stewart, has also um, looked at ha having a few patients have some uh, improvement with the use of uh, the ACE inhibitors. I've anecdotally heard of some patients who um, see a reduction in their sort of hyperadrenergic state, which is, is often associated with the higher blood pressure POTS, um, that they've used mestinon and they're actually seeing a, a pretty dramatic improvement, which is not really um, directly, it doesn't make direct sense, but if you think about that there's just this, this imbalance in the sympathetic and parasympathetic, mestinon stimulates your parasympathetic system. Right. So um, that is, I think, something that could use more research. We, we do have a study showing that mestinon reduces tachycardia in POTS, but it didn't look at other things that mestinon might do to help or not help POTS patients. Um, all right, well, we're, we're slightly past 12. I know there's a lot of other questions. Um, I would uh, want everyone to know that we have monthly webinars and there's always gonna be a ton of questions. So hopefully we'll get to some of those questions in a future webinar. You can also check out our autonomic disorders video library at vimeo.com slash dysautonomia. And you'll find a lot of videos from Dr. Boris and the other medical experts who specialize in, in um, POTS and other forms of dysautonomia, where you can often find little nuggets of useful information. And um, Dr. Boris, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. And we hope everyone will be joining us in Philly at Dysautonomy International's annual conference. Dr. Boris will definitely be there since he's our resident Philly doctor. Um, it is July 26th to 28th in Philadelphia. The official hotel details and all that haven't been announced yet, but that will be up on our website in the next month or so. So we hope you guys will join us. And that's it, Dr. Bruce, you got any final words? <laughs> um, no, I think, uh, I mean, I would just say, uh, I hope that uh, y'all are, are connected with a, uh, a decent provider, and I hope that uh, these data can help uh, improve the symptoms that may not be adequately controlled for you at this point. And hopefully we'll get to uh, POTS 2.0 in the next few years and, um, and uh, be able to really manage this better. So thanks for inviting me to uh, present these two papers. All right. Well, thank you. We will see, we'll have you back on soon enough. <laughs> All right. Take care, everybody. Bye.